everybody, welcome to another edition of the IAIB Spotlight. I want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. It's a day after Thanksgiving, I know, but um, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. I hope everybody had a great meal and spent it with their family. Um, I- I'm still full. I could barely move at this point, but I'm going to push through and I'm going to I'm going to make this the best podcast possible. Uh, today, we have a great guest. We have an IIB member, someone that's active on the forum. Uh, you may know him from the podcasting world because if you if you're trying to learn how to podcast, uh, this is a name that you guys know. Dave Jackson from the School of Podcasting, schoolpodcasting.com is with us today. How are you doing, Dave? I'm doing uh, like you. I'm I'm still full, uh, hoping I don't fall asleep in the middle of the interview. So if we just don't, both just nod off in the middle, we, you know, it's the day after Thanksgiving. What do you expect? Well, we might need to change the show to like the School of Napping, and they can just watch <laughs> us take a nap. I was actually once thought of, I was going to do a power nap podcast. Just have it start off with an intro and say, and sleep. And then in 20 minutes, just have like an alarm go off. And, uh, you know, every episode would kind of sound the same, but just 20 minutes of space while you nap. Listen, I think that's, I've heard some podcasts that have, that have put me to sleep. And I think I've, I've heard some podcasts where the guest has fallen, to, <laughs> fallen asleep. So it's nothing, it's nothing out of the ordinary, Dave. But I want to talk to you about uh, how you got started in podcasting. And uh, you're, you're one of the first guys that really started podcasting you started in 2005 and that's really when the podcasting boom kind of started um but tell me a little bit about how you got into podcasting why you got into podcasting did you call it a podcast or were you just doing an, a radio show on the internet well yeah actually i was doing audio on the internet i actually had a a newsletter my, my background i one of the reasons why i was able to just jump into audio is i uh, i'm a musician so I, i've always run sound systems at, at church. I'm a guitar player. So I was already familiar with mixers and microphones and things like that. And uh, I had a newsletter that had a pretty decent following for musicians on how to get more gigs and run your band, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I f- it was back, I forget, that you used to have these little players you would put on your website. And it was this little flash thing that would spin around when you uh, put it. So you'd upload an MP3 file and people could actually listen, listen to your newsletter. And so I was like, okay. So I started doing that. And just... That alone, because you added tone of voice to your newsletter, I started getting more feedback instantly. It was like, wow, there's a real person behind that. Yeah. And so I started interviewing people over the phone because I don't know that Skype was around back then. I'd have to think about that. But uh, I was uh, doing stuff like that and putting it on the website. And then a friend of mine that I interviewed uh, was another big internet marketing guy. And he came back from some convention. And, and uh, I had missed, this tells you how long ago it was, I had missed the MySpace boat. And, uh, and that's the ship he, had sailed at this point. <laughs> yeah, the MySpace ship had, had sailed. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know. I was, you know, everybody else had billions of, of uh, MySpace followers. And I'm like, yeah, I'll get on it one day. And uh, so he came back from this thing. He said, hey, I, I heard this new thing. It's, it's going to be huge. You got to get on this one. This would be perfect for you. And I'm like, great, what is it? And he goes, it's podcasting. And I'm like, what, what pod, pod, who, you know? And yeah. I remember Googling it, and there was maybe two pages. And, and and there wasn't hardly anything. It was a little bit about Adam Curry and, you know, he was launching this format thing. But it just there wasn't much to, to get started. And once I finally went through the little bit of information that was there and kind of pieces parted stuff together and, you know, I actually uploaded a file and then saw it come back down in this software called Juice, which I think is still around. But it was like one of the first podcatchers. And I went, oh, OK. And so I just started taking my newsletter and turning it into a podcast. And then when I kind of got done with that and in Google, there was, you know, Rob Walsh, who now works for Libsyn, was doing Podcast 411. And there was there was like literally like 10 people podcasting. And so I was like, oh, wow, there are other people doing this. And uh, I just thought at the time, I, uh, my background's in training. And uh, I the, the great thing about being in training is the minute that sales uh, doesn't hit their quota, the first thing that gets whacked is is not let's work smarter by any means. That would make no sense at all. But they whacked the training department. So I, I found myself uh, between jobs and, and um, was basically going to go back to school to get a, a, an official degree in uh, in teaching. And so uh, I was like, I need a, another job that's going to have flexible hours because my original degree was in electronic engineering of all things. And uh, I had put myself through school as a waiter before, and I didn't really want to go back to being a waiter. And I thought, hmm, if this whole thing with supply and demand is still in effect, and this podcasting thing is going to be huge. Um, I loved podcasting at that point. I'd actually started out my own podcast, and I was like, other people want to know how to do this. I'm going to launch a membership site. And the School of Podcasting was born at that point. So I just started, as I would find a resource, as, as I would find something for 
here's cool music that's affordable and here's uh here's a cool wordpress theme or whatever uh, i would just start adding it to the school of podcasting so for a while that's basically what it was i just kept adding more and more and more and more information and then the running gag for a while was the great thing about the school of podcasting is it has a ton of information uh, the bad news about the school of podcasting was it had a ton of information so i had to kind of go back and thin the herd and kind of come up with my preferred method of of podcasting because it was a little overwhelming at the time but that's that's how I got involved with it it was just something where for for me being kind of a creative guy anyway I love the the creativity of it uh, I can definitely talk faster than I type so it was for me it was better than writing a newsletter and the fact that uh, it just seemed to connect better with people I was like oh I am all over this and I remember I uh, had sent out like one of my first I think I was up to like episode three and I got a voicemail feedback from a guy in Germany named Michael Van Lahr. And here I was literally, you know, recording this audio next to the water heater in the basement. <laughs> and and here comes a voice from Germany. And it really hit me that wow, this is this is a global thing. This isn't uh, you know, just a local thing. This is there's a dude in Germany that's listening to my podcast. And I that just I was like, all right, that's at that point it was you know, if, if this was drugs, that first voicemail was free. The rest, are, yeah, <laughs> it's like, all right, I'm hooked, I'm in, and um, yeah. And at that point, I, I went on a, a tear for a while. I, I had a 1.7 different podcasts going at one time. How many do you do? You do? Oh God, I've, I mean, if if we add up the net, the network does like 13, but I think I'm doing like seven of them. Yeah, see, I was yeah. in that boat, and, uh, and then I, I, just, I mean, I'm not even adding like the guest spots that I do on other shows. You know, I'll call into like one show, and I'll do another show every now and then. So, I mean, maybe maybe the least that I'm doing a seven, so seven to ten at least. Right. So that's, I mean, everything, any passion I had, I became a podcast. So I, I was trying to lose weight, so I started a, a weight loss show, and then I I did the one for musicians. I started one about podcasting. Uh, I love geeky web building stuff, so I started one for uh, you know weekly web tools. It's all about WordPress and things like that. So anything that I loved became a podcast. See, and I and think it, that's a great thing. And and I've I've always told people, and you're a great example of this. You know, a lot of people when they start off doing a podcast, to me and and what I've seen, and you know, I'll probably get an email saying, "Well, that's not true. There are a lot of these kind of podcasts. It's either comedy or tech." Mm -hmm. I see a lot of tech podcasts and I see a lot of comedy podcasts, but for someone like you that does a lot of these little niches and whatever you're interested in, uh, and you're talking about, I mean, you could talk about tech, but you could talk about weight loss, you could talk about building a WordPress site, you could talk about podcasting. I feel like it's a little bit more focused, and you're able to kind of attract more of an audience because it's not so broad. Uh, what do you, do you agree with that? Or do you think the uh, broader your show is, the more of an audience you could possibly have? No, see the, the thing, I just heard this stat uh, yesterday. I was listening to the, the Jillian Michaels podcast, who's the, the trainer on the biggest loser. And she said that TV is losing four to 7% of their audience per year. And I went, whoa, that's a pretty, you know, it doesn't sound that big, four to 7%. But when you're talking about, you know, millions of viewers i'm like that's that's a lot and um and i thought about it and i i four years ago i got married to make a very long story short and we basically just turned we unplugged the tv we kept the internet we unplugged the tv because i don't really care what the kardashians are up to and it just seemed like everything we were watching was crap and so recently when uh football season came around I, I bought a free antenna you know so i can actually get free tv and i'm so i'm watching tv again and it's just it's the stuff that's just so it's watered down it's not going to offend anybody there's no edge to it you know if you watch early clips of saturday night, saturday night live with like uh chevy chase and richard pryor there was like an edge like that oh, was like bo yeah. borderline offensive and i'm like man there's no way they could do that now and so in in the process of trying to make you know, content for everybody, they're making content for nobody. And, 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 the, same, and the same thing could apply to radio. Uh, you know, the Howard mm -hmm. Stearns of the world and the Opie and Anthony's and uh, the Ron and Fez, these guys do not stand a chance on terrestrial radio because radio has become a watered-down version of what it was, and it's the Ryan Seacrest show. Every show that you listen to <laughs> is pretty much another Ryan Seacrest going on there. And you know what? There's a place for that, absolutely. But there's really no... Uh, there's no difference between the morning show in L.A. and the morning show in New York and the morning show in Chicago. Uh -huh. It's all the same guy that you're reproducing because you're so you're so ups uh, afraid to kind of lose an lose a specific audience. You know, you want to appeal to as many people as possible. 
Yeah, when I uh, I was doing training once for a program that uh, I, I did training in newspapers. I would go around to newspapers and train them on how to use these gigantic scanners. And it was always fun. I'd, I'd be in a new town. I'd be like in Oklahoma. All right, cool. And you turn on the radio, and it was, wow, Two Tickets to Paradise, You Shook Me All Night Long, and some Zeppelin song followed by Pink Floyd. And then I'd go to Los Angeles, and there was Two Tickets to Paradise, You Shook Me All It was like the same station everywhere I went. And I just like, you think there'd be some sort of local flavor, and it yeah. was just it's a nah. shame. It really is. But I mean, that's to our benefit. I mean, mm-hmm. we benefit from this because I get emails from people that have been doing a podcast and, you know, I'll get an email saying like, hey, listen, Andrew, uh, I started doing a podcast. I have 100 people listening to my show. How do I grow it? Am I doing this? Am, am I should I continue doing it? It's been a couple of months and I only have a couple hundred people a week. Listen, I'm like, that's a hundred, couple hundred people. That's great. Yeah. Just keep doing it. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, you mean you mean to tell me a couple hundred people every week are going to your website and downloading this? You know, you're doing it. I mean, this guy's doing it for a hobby, obviously. He's not doing it as a right. business practice. But it, that's amazing to me that you could capture that audience without any kind of mainstream media marketing, uh, without a major network putting in millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars into your product. I mean, that's unbelievable. Oh, it is. And, and so if we go back to to what I now call narrow casting versus broadcasting, when you find when your audience finds you and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this guy is talking about this or like I get a lot I do I still do the weight loss podcast, which is hilarious because I'm not losing weight. And the <laughs> and and the thing that I hear that people Listen, say, can I no, join you on that po- on that podcast? Because I think I put on like 10 pounds in the last day. <laughs> in the last 48 hours? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> And so, but I get that people are like, Hey, you know what I love about your podcast? I'm like, what? And they're like, I'm just like you, I keep losing seven and finding 10. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. Um, but so you, you connect with those people. And when they're like, Oh wow, this guy is just like me, or uh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. And they go to iTunes and they click that, you know, download all button. I hear it time and time again, where people have gone back to, you know, my first episode was back in 2005. It's still getting downloaded, you know, nine years later. It's ridiculous. So, so. tell me about the first couple episodes. Um, and obviously, you went in this with with some sort of understanding because you come from a musical background. But what was that like? What was your first setup like? I mean, you're like, okay, I'm going to do a podcast now and go. What was that feeling? What kind of equipment did you use? Because I always want to know about people's first experience. Uh it, it's a very unique thing, and you said it was, you know, the first one was free, and then now you're you're hooked on this thing. So, right. wh- give me that experience for you. Well, it was, um, you know, so I I kind of Googled like, okay, who else is doing this? You know, so I'm listening to to Rob Walsh, and I'm listening to uh, there was uh, Don and Drew were kind of like the Howard Stern and Keith and the Girl were these, uh, you know, kind of morning not morning zoo like wacky sound effects but they were basically a, a team that were trying to be outrageous and, and push the envelope to a certain extent and then uh, obviously adam curry the guy that started podcasting that helped invent it he was doing kind of the state of the art of podcasting so i kind of had an idea and and most of these people had some sort of intro music so i'm like all right i need some sort of intro and that whole nine yards so i, I figured it out i was using a program called um mixcraft i believe was the original one i used okay yeah because I, uh, they had something like audio, oh, some audio program to make MP3 files, and this was a little more robust. I'm on a PC, so I, I wasn't using GarageBand or Audacity or things like that. And so I, I heard this one guy was doing, um, he'd started a podcast called PodCheck. It's long gone. His name is Scott Fletcher, and I loved his voice. And I'm like, Scott, what microphone are you using? Because I had a bunch lying around. He's like, oh, I use this condenser microphone. And, and I'm like, okay, great. So I went out and bought this condenser microphone. It was kind of expensive, not knowing that condenser microphones pick up everything in the room. Sure. I mean, you know, and, and Scott's, I've, heard, Scott. I've heard people, you know, we've had Mike Phillips on, which is a brilliant, brilliant <laughs> audio expert and uh, you know, he, he's a huge advocate of, of, of dynamic microphones and the ATR 2100, which every podcaster in the world has now. And if you don't even just get it as a secondary mic, because the thing is so inexpensive and it's a great mic. I like condenser mics. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of con- like I'm using a condenser here. We're doing a lot of processing, but you're absolutely right. Condensers are great if you are in a soundproof environment and there's right. I mean, just padded walls everywhere. So if you're institutionalized, a a condenser mic is perfect for you, but if you're doing a podcast in your house, you know what? You're absolutely right. Dynamic mic, you got to go with it. Yeah, if you can see the dryer, it's not good to have the condenser <laughs> microphone. 
<laughs> so uh you know so i did that and i was recording directly right into the pc i would just i had a uh, a small mixer lying around from from being in a band and would uh plug the mic into the the mixer kind of add a little bass and treble to my voice and run it right into the uh the computer and then i would just mix in the music and stuff uh later and uh did that for probably three years and in three years i lost two episodes and uh, recording, Skype came along, so we started recording Skype calls, and I forget the program I eventually dumped that uh, I had one, a fairly important interview, and I had to do the call of shame, where you call them back and go, man, that was an awesome interview, and they're like, thanks, you're like, great, can we do that again? Because it Cause didn't record. It. Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> it, it, well, it, reco- it just garbled it, and I was yeah. like, and at that point, I, I started recording with a, a portable recorder. You know, so things have moved along the way, and then I went from the condenser microphone to a Shure SM58 because it sounded great. It was a hundred bucks, and I had one. So, and that that cut out the sound of the dryer in the background. So I used that for a while, and uh, you know, just over the years, things have have changed. I, I used the 58 for a really long time, and then uh, I heard about this Electrovoice RE320 microphone that had come out, and uh, it turns out that Electrovoice is right in my backyard. And uh, or is it Audio Technica? I always forget which one. But anyway, I contacted the company and said, "Hey, I'm I'm Mr. School, a podcasting guy. Would love to try one. If I could just, I'm not trying to get a free microphone. Just want to try it. And uh, you know, can I can I have one to play with? So they sent it over, and I was like, "Wow, I really like the sound of this." And uh, what was cool is I went to send it back, and they said, "Well, do you want to buy it?" I'm like, mm, "Don't really have the money right now." Oh no, I don't. That's why I'm I, sending it. <laughs> right, but I would be more than happy to talk about your your microphone for the next four weeks. Uh, at the beginning of the podcast, if you like, and I'll keep it. And they went, that seems like a fair trade. So I basically traded advertising for their microphone and uh, and got to keep it. So That's that, that that became the the staple for a while. And then uh, my wife and I started a podcast, and that's why I'm using the Audio Technica 2100 right now because that's uh, it's an easy one to just plug in and go directly into Skype. And uh, so uh, that's what I'm using right now. So between those two, I still use my RE320 when I'm doing my regular stuff. But uh, for Skype and stuff, it's just easy enough to to you know pull in the uh, Audio Technica and plug it right into Skype. So I have so many questions for you because it, it, it's it's a treat for me to interview someone that was here from the beginning of of the mm-hmm. you know, creation of podcasting and and because you could kind of tell us how it's changed from 2005 to now. I mean, we're approaching eight years. Uh, nine nine years. Uh, but this is it, it's amazing to me that in nine years, it a lot has changed, right? It's oh, yeah. become more mainstream. A lot of people have come and gone. Uh, to you, what, what have you noticed? What have what have been the major things that have changed in podcasting from the time you started to you know now, right? You know. Well, the the first thing I remember the very first New Media Expo, because again, everybody at that point listened to everybody's episodes because. There just weren't that many. And I remember walking into the the bar at, uh, I forget where it was in California, but uh, we went to this hotel thing, and you know it was like a, a, an episode of Cheers. Like, C.C. Chapman would walk in, and we'd all go, hey, C.C. We all knew him because we saw his picture on his website, and somebody else would come in, and, and we just all knew each other. And it was kind of interesting because I remember even at that point, I was bringing up things like sponsors and things like that, and, and I was looked at like the devil. Because Why? The, oh, because, because this is art, man. This is this is this is the revolution, and we're going to go out and we're going to tell the world, and we're going to change the world. And we're all going to you know do this, and so it was kind of weird that I was even talking about. Well, how can we monetize this? You know, this would be kind of cool, and we could promote this and that. So by the second uh, uh, expo, here I was again going. I'm pretty sure we could monetize that, and, and other people were talking about that, but there was still this faction. It was like. Dude, you're ruining it. This is art. It's the revolution, man. You can't, you know. So it was really weird that I remember at the time it was like, "What you wanna you wanna make money with podcasting? Oh, you sell out, you know." Yeah. And it was just it was like really weird. So yeah, the second expo, especially people are like, "Oh, there's that Dave guy. He's the guy that wants to make money with this podcast." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, why not?" It's uh, Do you mean to tell the- me, Dave? You mean to tell me you had the nerve? To want to make oh. a couple bucks off of something that you're dedicating time and effort into. I mean, that that's yeah. absurd. I know. What was I thinking? And um, now, on the other hand, that wasn't why I got into podcasting. But I was kind of like, all right, I see how this is working. And we should be able to figure out some way to squeeze a penny out of this or two to at least pay for the bandwidth. Hold on, you know. So, But it was interesting because as it, as it grew, each convention got bigger and bigger and bigger. So oh. that... Um, I had to take a couple years off because I did finally go back to, to school. But um, it was interesting that, um, you know, you went from knowing everybody to now you go to, like, I'm going to be there in January. 
And I have my own little group of my own little bubble of of pot, you know, the podcasting people, you know. But there's a whole, you know, knitting bubble, and there's a whole, you know, sled dog bubble, and you know, all these different little niches that I'm just not part of. But it's interesting now just to see it grow and and grow and grow, and uh, it's it's really cool. And yet we, so we have all these different topics that we're we're not connected on, but we all are trying to grow our audience. We're all trying to get the best quality audio and video that we can without having to, you know, mortgage grandma to the gypsies. I mean, and, and that's uh, the best part of the community. I, and it's amazing to me because it's coming, I, I know a lot of people in radio, when I started out doing a podcast, uh, a lot of my friends were from radio and they pretty much told me like, listen, in radio, it's a dog eat dog world. Nobody wants to help anybody because they think you're going to get it. You're going to, you know, it's an advantage if you know something. And this trade secret concept does not exist in podcasting. And it's amazing to me because everybody's helping everybody. Everybody's giving advice to everybody. If, if, you, know, if you don't know what kind of camera to use, someone is going to help you. It's a very open community, and it's totally different than any other industry out there. Uh, I think that goes back to the very beginning because at the very beginning, we didn't know what we were doing. And it, it, there wasn't a manual. You know, Todd Cochran hadn't wrote, put together the first book yet. And so we were all just trying to figure it out on our own. And all of a sudden there'd be, you know, a, uh, another little piece of the puzzle. Oh, have you heard about this uh, particular thing? You can do this or here's this cool microphone or, wow, there's a new mixer that's really powerful but yet uh, affordable. And so we all just kind of helped each other out. It was just a case of, hey, I know he did that. And we started interviewing each other on each other's shows and, and cross-promoting. And, yeah, so it's it's just one of those things I'm glad to see it's continued on. I, I've run into very few people – that don't want to play ball. I, I've had uh, I've had a couple people on my musician podcast that they do a podcast similar to mine, and I'm like, hey, why don't I interview you on my show and vice versa? And you know, you've got a, a great insight. And they just went, nah, we don't do that. And I went, okay. Well, the good that's, thing yeah. is it's your it's your it's your podcast. You you don't have to, but uh, you know, that's I, I've run into that very seldom. It, it, it's interesting how uh, different industries now have kind of seeped into podcasting. Podcasting to me was always you know, the guy living next door that has a passion for something and he talks about it on the Internet. But now you're seeing, you know, the Adam Carolla's come over and uh, every radio show now has a podcast version. And you're seeing television stars doing a podcast and movie stars doing a podcast. Do you think that hurts us as uh, as, let's say, podcasters or do you think that's helping us get it, to get more mainstream exposure and helping us get, you know, eyeballs that we normally would not have? Yeah, it's. On one hand, I don't know that anybody's going to stop listening to me so they can go listen to, and I'm not making this up, Kathy, Kathy Lee Gifford now has a podcast. She does, uh, yeah. <laughs> she, yeah, so, you know, maybe now we're going to start getting whatever you would call her audience, you know, into podcasting who might then stumble across something that, uh, you know, is, is something that they would enjoy. Or uh, Pat, uh, I forget the guy, there's the band Train. Pat, Pat Manahan, Monahan, or something. Monahan, yeah. yeah. He has a really interesting podcast where he's out on the road interviewing like his opening act, and they sit around and just play guitars and sing, and it's it's a really cool behind the scenes. I wonder what it's like to be on tour with uh, Train kind of look at stuff. So to me, anytime somebody can bring more eyeballs into podcasting, I'm all about it because there are seven days a week. The last time I checked, and Pat's podcast is I don't know maybe an hour long. And that gives them six other days if they listen an hour a day in the car to find something else to listen to. So I think hopefully where, they'll find my stuff. I think where it's going to hurt podcasters is that front page discoverability that we would get on you know, iTunes, for example. Um, from the time that iTunes started you know, having podcasts on there, I would see regular guys, I mean non-celebrities, all over the front page getting featured. And now – over the last couple of years, that has kind of changed, and it's more and more these celebrity types that are getting that front page exposure. I think that's where it hurts us. But for example, if you're into conspiracy theories and you know paranormal stuff, and you're a big Art Bell or a uh, George Norrie fan from coast to coast, you're going to go on, you're going to listen to a podcast, and you're going to say, you know what, I want to find more shows like this. Oh look, Dave does a conspiracy theory show. Let me go check his show out. So I think in that sense it helps us, but also front page discoverability is no longer there for us. That really is the one piece of the puzzle that's kind of missing. I mean, Stitcher does a good job of, hey, if you like this show, you'll like this kind of stuff. And, and even iTunes does have people that subscribe to this show also 
do this, but on the on the app, the i you know the podcasts app from Apple, there isn't much of in in terms of helping to find you other shows that you might like, and um, I would like to see that improved. And you know there are podcasts that people review other podcasts, and I always try to spotlight other podcasts. But I think that's the one thing that's if there was a way to to do it to uh, make it easier to find podcasts, good podcasts. That's the other thing too. the The good news is it's super easy to to make a podcast. the The bad news is it's it's super easy to make a podcast. Oh, very well, easy now to make a podcast. Yeah. Now it's not easy to make a good podcast. I guess we could say. It so, and that's a great segue be- into the school of podcasting. Um, tell us how you started this. Uh, obviously, you help people. You're a podcasting coach. You're providing mm-hmm. information that a lot of people don't know about um you're you know on the iib forum that's how i got introduced to you and uh you had some great insight on affiliate programs i had a question about amazon affiliate so you're you're able to give all this information away to people but tell us about how you decided to start the school of podcasting and to help people in podcasting yeah it's um i'd always loved Kind of, uh, and I hate to say the word internet marketing because it, it always there's always that used car salesman kind of uh, uh, mentality that comes up when people hear that. But I always like playing with uh, websites. I used to use Dreamweaver before that. I used Front Page, so I was always building stuff on the internet. And so I, I was hearing about, hey, there's you know the new hot thing was building uh, membership sites. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. And I I was doing my newsletter and everything was great. And then this came along, and I was like, oh, you know what? If if uh, you know, maybe I should try a membership site. So I went out and bought a, a program called A Member and plugged it in. And was like, okay, cool. And then it was just a matter of getting the content. So for me, that was one really cool thing. One aspect of it is the fact that it scratched my geeky itch. Right, I got to build something. It was creative. Then, if you take in my my teaching side, the fact that I get to help people, it was like, okay. Uh, I, I get to do this now, and and let's figure out where do I want people to go, what path do I want them to follow. So, like when you log in, one of the first classes that I recommend is called Planning Your Podcast, which goes through and it has a bunch of questions you need to ask yourself. Like, okay, why are you starting the podcast? You know, who are you podcasting to? And you know, uh, what's the how will you know when your podcast is successful and things of that nature. So. It actually walks you through that, and then from there, it's like, okay, now let's talk about gear. And it's just a, a it's material that's just come up from helping people go from start to finish. And so it's like, okay, now that you understand who you're podcasting to, let's talk about how are you going to record it. Is it you and a co-host? Is it just you? Are you going to be on Skype? Are you going to be in the same room with people? Okay, let's answer all those questions. And based on those, here's the equipment you should probably do. And uh, you know, here's I always have a. Uh, there's three options. There's always the, okay, if you really have no budget, this is about as cheap as we can do it if you're going to do it well. Then there's kind of the, hey, if you've got a little more money in the budget, this is a really solid option. And then there's always the Cadillac version. If you have a, an unlimited budget, uh, you can go ahead and uh, go that route. So it, it does. It walks you through planning your podcast, and then it goes into recording. And then from there, it's like, okay, now that you've got a podcast, I guess you need a website. So it goes into you know everything from how to install WordPress to what are plugins and how what's a page what's a you know what's a post and all that other fun stuff and and plugins and themes and then from there it's like okay now uh, let's talk about Libsyn and Blueberry what's the difference between the two and you can actually see me publish a show to Libsyn and publish a show using Blueberry and you can see the difference and so okay here's here's the difference between the two it's it's really hard to compare those two because they are they do have uh, their own little separate niche to that and then from there it's like okay now how do I get this into iTunes how do I get it into Stitcher and then there's also a course on okay here are some ways you can make money with that so it's just really been things that as I go along and I pick up tips and insights and things like that that uh, I just all right that's a good point let's let's put this in the school of podcasting and some of it's from uh, user feedback I uh, I'm sitting right here next to a, a Roland R-05, and I always tell people, you know, this is what I use to record off off uh, my computer, off my mixer. I don't go directly into that. And so somebody bought one and said, "Hey, Dave, do you have a, a tutorial on, on you know how to set this up? It, it looks pretty easy. Just press record and talk." He goes, "But what about all these other settings?" And I'm like, "You know what? I don't have a tutorial on that, but I will by the end of the weekend." So some of the material just comes from people going through the. Uh, tutorials and saying, hey, this is great, love that, got that, got the Twitter thing down, built my own Facebook page, good, awesome. Hey, I can't find this. And nine times out of ten, there's already a tutorial for it. But if it's not, then I go through and, and make it. And then they get to be the uh, 
the judge, okay, is this what you were looking for? And if they're like, yep, perfect, I went through it, everything's working great, got it exactly the way I want it, perfect. And so, some of the stuff on here, um, because I follow your website and I follow uh, the podcast, and you, you, it's not all technical, which I like that. It's not about you know hooking up a mixer, which a lot of people right. do, and they do a great job at that. But something like podcast media kits, you did a show mm -hmm. on creating a media kit, and I'll tell you, this would have been really handy for me when I've needed to create a media kit, which I have. You know, we've done Blog World, we've done New Media Expo, we've done all those things, and we have media kits with us or when we're trying to approach a new advertiser. So th these are things that you really don't think about because you're thinking about the technical aspects so much right. when it comes to podcasting. But having a media kit for your company, for your business, because having a podcast is like having a business, is a very important thing. And I think it's overlooked in many cases. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that you don't think about. Maybe you're just starting it on a passion. This is going to be a hobby or whatever it is. It's nice to take the time and put one together because when somebody says, hey, uh, I'm Joe so-and-so from this and this company, and I like your podcast, I think our product would fit nicely with your audience. And you kind of look at that and go, you know what, it, it probably would. And they say, you know, can you tell us a little more about your podcast? Well, that's a pretty warm lead. And if you can turn around and say, here's my media kit, and here's who is listening, and here's how many downloads I get. And here's what people are saying in iTunes and, you know, just that whole nine yards and you hit them with, yes, it's uh, X amount of money to sponsor per episode. But if you buy four, there's a, you know, 15% discount. And plus you can, you know, you can sponsor the newsletter, you can sponsor the website. Which one would you like, Mr. Potential Sponsor? And then you you go from there. But it's uh, so many times we're, we're just having fun that uh, when somebody then says, hey, you know, they come along and you're like, oh, and then you scramble to put together a media kit. By the time you actually get one done, the lead's grown cold or they you just lose that uh, the moment in some cases. you got to restoke the fire to get it back going. So, yeah. And, and I talk about that. I talk about, um, in some cases, just the, the content of your show, how to, to form that. Everybody loves to have... You know, the uh, on one hand, we hear you know you should share about yourself and it should you, you know show your personality, and that's true. It people love that. There's a, a podcast I listen to now uh, by a he manages comedians. His name is Barry Katz, and I listened to a, like a 60 minute episode the other day. The one thing I remember is he said his dad died when he was four. It was that one little piece of personal information that really stuck out to me. I was like, wow, that had to be awful. And so when you can share stuff like that, that's that can really bond you to your audience absolutely but but don't make seven minutes of it that don't have anything to do with the topic you're going to talk about if i'm going to be talking about microphones i'm not going to spend seven minutes at the beginning of my podcast telling you about the silly thing my sister said absolutely no i agree with you 100 percent. there needs to be a really good balance between what you're trying to achieve if you if your point of your show is to talk about microphones you really shouldn't concentrate too much about your thanksgiving meal yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the reality of it. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you get a lot of questions from people, and um, I want to talk about unrealistic expectations that some people have in podcasting because uh, I don't do podcast coaching. I don't, but if someone emails me because of the IIB, I sit there and I send them an email, and I get a lot of questions about monetizing the podcast. That is something that I get all the time, more than having good content, more than marketing the show, more than anything else. I get okay, I've been doing this for six months. How do I make some money from it? Um, how do you respond to that? Because I always have a difficult time. Maybe I'm a little too blunt when it comes to that because my whole approach with this has been, I started this as a hobby, it turned into a full-time full -time job and it's my career now. But I don't know how to respond to someone when they say, I'm, I'm starting a podcast so I could potentially make money from it. How do you respond to that, Dave? Don't. Don't. Basically, one word. <laughs> Just don't. Well, because the the whole theory behind monetization is you have built a relationship with your audience so that you are seen as a, a trusted uh, advisor or friend, however you want to look at that, and you're reliable. Those are the things that, you know, if you're going to buy from somebody, you want somebody who you, you trust them, they're reliable, they've given you maybe information in the past that, that worked out great, and... Um, they're smart. So when you first start off, you know, if somebody, I, I had uh, somebody today, uh, I, I've never heard of this person and, you know, seems like a nice guy, comes up on my uh, Gmail chat and says, hey, I'm available today for an interview if you got time. And I'm like, nice to meet you too. 
um, I, I, you know, I said, well, tell me about yourself and a little bit about your podcast. It was a little forward. And so if we take that into monetization, people are, Hey, I've got my six episodes out and, uh, you know, how do I now make, you know, I, I want to make uh, five figures a month. It just doesn't happen that way. You've got to build that relationship with people. And if you can, whatever schedule you're going to do, uh, find one and stick with it. Uh, the one thing people go, how do I grow my audience? My my first answer is don't quit. Yeah, <laughs> because keep doing if it. You, yeah, keep doing it. Um, so become reliable. So whatever it is, if, for me, it's every Monday is when my show comes out. And and then from there, give them content. It, it kind of goes back to knowing who your audience is. And that's sometimes the hard part is you're not 100% sure, but that will come again over time as you start to interact with your audience, as they email, as they, they tweet you and things like that. You'll get to know your audience and if you can understand what they need or if there's any pains that you can help them fix, wow, this guy was really super helpful. He really helped me out. And he seems really reliable because every Monday there a show is. And uh, he seems kind of funny and kind of wacky. And I, I like that guy. I, I would like to hang out with this guy. Okay, great. Now that I've got that relationship and I say, by the way, if you'd like to learn how to podcast, go over to schoolpodcasting.com. Now I can turn that into you know, something that's going to help put gas in my car. Absolutely, but, yeah. But if it's just like, hi, I'm Dave Jackson, and uh, you know, here's my product for uh, you know, sixty bucks. Go buy my new ebook course, whatever. People are like, who are you again? What? Why would I listen to you? So it's it's one of those things where it's I understand it. You know, I very much understand that. Hey, I'd like to make some money because wow, I've done seven episodes now, and I, I it's taken me four hours to put out an hour an episode. I'm like, uh huh, sure is. And uh, it just they they just want to uh, be on Oprah. I, I think it was. I think it's a difficult thing. I think it's a really difficult thing for people to understand that you need to put in time. Yeah, I uh, I wrote a book called More Podcast Money that kind of goes over some of the things I've done, and it is part of it is is knowing your audience. I uh, on my my weight loss show, um, I have a total gym. It's uh, sitting in my sister's basement right now, but I have a total gym, and uh, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get smart because I've always heard that you know. To get to yes, you have to get to whatever it is, six or seven no's, right? And I thought, I'm going to piggyback on Christy Brinkley and Chuck Connors, and I'm going to talk about, here's my personal connection with the the uh, Total Gym, and I'll put an ad there, and I'll make an easy-to-follow link. And the problem is Total Gyms are, A, not that cheap. They're not expensive as other things, but they're not cheap still. And there's that whole thing of shipping that may or may not be an issue. So I promoted it for a year and was talking about it, and I really liked it, and was trying to get pumped up, and I finally sold one. I made uh, seventy-five dollars commission on that, and was like, "Okay, well, that was for the whole year, basically." You know, I was like, "Well, that almost paid for six months of my bandwidth." So then I found this thing called Fit Deck cards, and they're fifteen bucks. I think I made a dollar fifty a deck, and I was like, "Oh wow, cool!" So I, I bought one. So again, I could talk about it firsthand, and was checking them out, and, and actually dealed myself a workout and it took all of uh, like seven minutes and I'm doing push-ups and sit-ups and didn't need anything, could do it wherever I was at. And I started talking about it on my podcast and uh, went over to uh, buy another deck and I saw where they had a coupon code and I, I emailed them because it was an affiliate uh, association. So if people used my link, I would earn money. And I said, you know, how do I get a coupon code? I'm, I'm this guy with this podcast, blah, blah, blah. And so they gave me a coupon code for 10% off. So I'm, I'm making again like a $1.50 a deck and I was getting three figure checks every month making a dollar fifty at a time. It was hilarious. I would just be sitting there, my email would say, You just earned three dollars and forty three cents, you know, from this order. Then no, no, you earned seven dollars, blah, blah, blah. You earned a dollar fifty. But I would get like five or six of those a day. Yeah, that's great. You know, and so it was a case of realizing that my audience was made up primarily of, I don't know, thirty to forty year old moms who were busy that worked and uh, didn't want to really couldn't go to the gym because they had the kids. And when I said, Hey, this is something you can do with your kids. You could actually, you know, do a workout in between commercials. It was a product that fit my audience. And that was one of the keys is you have to kind of understand your audience so you can get the right product. And so uh, that was a case where I learned that, okay, it, number one, you got to have a product that's going to fit your audience and that's, again, it's kind of hard because sometimes you don't know who your audience is. So that takes time. And once you figure that out, now you, you know what's going to be a home run, basically. So it, it, it takes time. So the, the person that signs up to, to make money with a podcast by next month, it's, it's tough unless you're coming from that market and you already know who's going to be listening. 
you know, it's going to take a little bit of time to, to figure that out. And even if you know your market, you still have to gain their trust. Absolutely. And, and you have to gain the trust of the advertiser as well. Um, yep. And th this is the thing. I, I always tell people an easy answer for me is, hey, you know, you just started a podcast. Your audience isn't that large. Why don't you try it in an affiliate program? If you make a couple bucks from it, yep. you're making a couple bucks from it. But then you understand how this works and you understand how to deliver a live read. You understand how to sell a product to your audience. There, there's more to it than going to a company saying, hey, I got this show. Give me money. Even when they do to give you that money, guess what? They need to see a return. That's it. And yeah, this I, I, somebody once told me, oh, yeah, and they were bragging about this. They go, oh, I got a new advertiser every month. That's not yeah, good. That's, yeah, that's not good. That means they're not staying. They're not seeing a result. And I had yeah. to explain. It goes, no, but I'm able to go out there and get the advertiser. I'm like, yeah, but how many of those are coming back? And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. They're not coming back. I'm like, now yeah. you burnt the bridge with that company. The relationship that you could have built, if you had waited maybe a year to approach that company and say, hey, listen, I got a podcast and I'm able to make some money. Uh, now you lost that because they're not going to, they don't have, they don't have faith in your company and, and your, in your, in right. your podcast. So and in some, go ahead. Go ahead. I was well, on a rant. In, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some cases, uh, this is really horrible if you inflate your numbers because now you tell them, well, I have uh, 2,000 downloads an episode when really you have, you know, 200. So they're expecting maybe, I don't know, maybe 5%. Uh, what would that be? 2% would be 2 or whatever. Let's say they expect 10 people to show up from your 2,000, except you have 200, so they're going to get one. And so now they go in and maybe they didn't ask for any kind of clarification, but they're like, yeah, we're going to try advertising and podcasting. And this guy goes, yeah, I got 2000 downloads. And then he gets 200. They get maybe one lead, if anything. And they're like, well, I don't know. Let's pull the money out of podcasting. This doesn't work. So the worst thing you can do right now is if you inflate your numbers, it's much better if you tell somebody, Hey, I have this money downloads. Um, I have a, my, my weekly web tools podcast, again, super niche. It's really short. And it's primarily about WordPress these days. And I get, I don't know, 700 downloads an episode. Nothing really huge. But when I told my, I had somebody approach me. They said, hey, we really like your show. Uh, we think your audience is who we're looking for. Can you tell us about them? And when I said, I, you know, I, have, I didn't say only 700. I had said I have 700 of people. And here they all, they're smart bus small business owners. They, they handle their own website, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, perfect. That's who we're looking for. So don't undersell your, your niche and don't uh, you know inflate your numbers because if I said, yo, I have 7,000 downloads, not 700, they're going to be looking for a much bigger return. But if you say, here it is, and, and that's where it is. The, the fun part of sponsorship is once they say, yes, I'm ready to go, now it's your job to prove that you sent them traffic. Yeah. And that, that is something you don't have to do with affiliate stuff. It is The nice thing about affiliate marketing, it's a good place to start. You don't have to, to spend 10 minutes explaining what a podcast is. You don't have to provide demographics that just look if somebody buys something you make some money uh the bad news is you know if you find a product that your audience doesn't want you don't make any money but uh yeah sponsors are cool but it, it does add a, a level of responsibility on your part now to to prove so that they can come back and and if they if they don't come back if it doesn't work on one hand it's i hope that guy that's getting a new podcast or a new sponsor every month is looking at his stats and figuring out, okay, why didn't this one work? Why? What does my audience want? I, I did okay with this one. I did awful with that. And those are, you know, here's the teacher in me. It's the learning opportunity when you have something uh, that you fail at. So uh, that's the joy of, of sponsorship. I, I got a I got a message from a guy, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say who it is, but it, it's yeah. someone that that's kind of involved in the in the podcasting community. And he wrote he wrote me an email and he said. Um, you know, I've been doing a podcast for this long. I got and his number was really good, but he's using one of the the services that kind of tracks and gets you advertising, like like a pod track. And yeah. he was he wanted to know how he could game the system and get downloads for his podcast. He goes, How do we how can I get unique downloads from my podcast so I make more money from the advertiser? And first of all, I'm I, I didn't respond, but the logic there was fascinating because Obviously, he gets paid based on per thousand, right? I mean, that's how some of these companies work. So he wants right. to he wants to get more downloads. But in a month or so, yeah, maybe for that first two months, you might make out and you might make a couple bucks extra. But the third month, when they're not seeing a return on those numbers, guess what? You 
they may not advertise with you at all. So you're absolutely right. Don't don't fudge those numbers and don't don't bloat them because if it's not accurate, they're not gonna. It's not gonna work. You brought up something interesting about the 700 downloads. See, that's valuable to me to know that you have 700 people that are listening every week. That to me is more valuable than having 25,000 that that may or may not listen. Well, yeah, it's it's and people like you mentioned earlier, the guy said I only have a hundred. You know, as, as a somebody who teaches in classrooms, my typical class is about thirty people. That's three times the size of a room that I'm normally in, and it at times it's hard to hold thirty people's attention, let alone a hundred. And you have a hundred people who are jumping through hoops, not huge hoops, but they're jumping through hoops to come get your content. So never underestimate that, and the fact that it's. You know, in my case, 700 people who are looking for ways to make their website get more traffic, uh, make it look good doing it. Uh, you know, maybe um, some cool tool to to boost conversions or whatever it is. And uh, they're all that's what they're looking for. And when I serve up something, they'll say, "Hey, that was really cool. I just had somebody uh, send me a voicemail about some really cool free software that uh, you can make contact forms, and it's a little." easier than some of the other stuff I've seen out there, and it's free. And so it's a, a cool little community, and that's one of the other aspects of podcasting is you become kind of the hub of all things, whatever your topic is, come through you so that you can then share it with your audience. There's a, a guy named Mark Gunn. He does Celtic music, right? So like mandolins and that kind of Robin Hood kind of sounding stuff. And he started a podcast about Celtic music. Now, I'm not a huge Celtic music person I, I i have no uh need to put on a skirt and and you know that any of that stuff but the people that love that love that and he is an actual celtic arctic music kind of guy and uh, he's really good at it and so he became like the expert why because you know for every you know one podcast on celtic music there's who knows five thousand blogs on it so he's already kind of standing out from the, the rest of the crowd and now uh festivals and all these other things about Celtic music are going to this guy. Well, the beautiful thing is when the festival says, hey, can we promote our festival You know, coming up in February? He's like, sure. Oh, by the way, here's my demo CD. You know, maybe I'll play that one and I can do a live broadcast from the, the festival or whatever. It's a brilliant way to get yourself smack dab in the middle of whatever community you're trying to uh, to join. Absolutely. I always tell people, no matter whatever the interest is of the podcast, reach out to other sites. It doesn't need to be a podcasting site, but if it's a blog, if it's a news site and has to do with what you're talking about, reach out to them, build a relationship with them, interview people that are involved in the business and in the industry that you're covering, and, and kind of spread the information out there. When we think podcasting, a lot of people just think, you know, okay, this is online radio and I'm going to do a show I'm going to put out the show and whoever the guest was is going to promote it and that's it but it doesn't have to be that if you know a blog that's covering exactly what you said just send an email I'd be like hey listen I interviewed this guy you guys might want to put this on your website here's the information thanks a lot you know what you just attracted a whole bunch of people that had no idea what a podcast is potentially that's it and it, it kind of comes down to networking with people and getting to know people in your little neck of the woods, whether it's leaving a comment on a blog sometimes is an easy way just to break the ice. I mean, that's basically how you found me was through participating in a forum. And the key to that is not to walk in the door and go, hi, I'm Dave. Here's my podcast. Because you're going to go, who, who are you again? And why would I care about your podcast? But if you go over there and I always tell the, the, the main, if you look at how people grow their audience, the first thing is you have to figure out who your audience is. That's step one. Step two, go there. Step three, make friends with them and build a relationship. And then once they care about who you are, then say, oh, by the way, I talked about this on my podcast. But everybody wants to go to step four and just go, hi, I'm Dave. Here's my podcast. Here's my podcast. People, Here's my affiliate links. Click here. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and the, the people it, that are the most successful, especially you know IIB members, the ones that are active on the forum, are the ones that are actually getting a result and getting new listeners from the from the from the community, and I think the same goes for all the Google uh, communities out there and the Facebook communities mm -hmm. for podcasting out there. The one that's going and promoting their show is not the one that's getting the eyeballs. The guy that goes in there, like Dave, goes into the groups and he comments and he you know he he relates about something. Someone asks about a microphone, he talks about the microphone. Now I see Dave's name out there, and I trust this guy. 
and I'm going to click on his podcast when he promotes it. Yeah, and you you got to make sure with forms especially, go in and read the terms of service. Because in some cases, some forms won't even let you put a link to your website. They're really anti kind of spam or, or – and, and the reason they do that is because a lot of people do just come in there and they're like, oh, look, here's my target audience. And they just – you know, everything's an affiliate link and a, a, a link back to their website. And and there, there were originally some really good uh, groups on LinkedIn, and I have seen where they've kind of, I don't know, a little bit degraded to just, hey, here's my latest episode. And it's like, eh, really? Okay. You know, where it used to be kind of more of a discussion of whatever, of, of uh, you know, the fact that Stitcher has a new portal or, or whatever, things that uh, people in, in uh, podcasting might be interested in instead of, hey, a new episode of the, you know, whatever Disco Boys podcast is out. Yeah, yeah. Um, with, with the affiliate affiliate stuff, uh, I've mm-hmm. seen a I've seen a boom in the last I guess year with this stuff. I think for a while, a lot of people took it as well. My the podcast is not good enough to have an ad, so they have an affiliate ad. But I've noticed a huge boom in the last year, and I think a lot of people are starting to make some serious money with this stuff, even if they don't. The, the advertise like a GoDaddy. Uh, let's just use them as an example, right. or. Uh, who else is a big one for the affiliate stuff? Uh, Carbonite and all these other companies. Right. I think people are starting to see some sort of result because it's out there and they're starting to realize how to market this stuff. Amazon, for an, for example, is a great program, an affiliate program to join uh, because pretty much everybody's using the site. And I think a lot of people are starting to see a result with that. So there's been a boom in this. Do you do you like personally? Do you like the affiliate stuff, or do you on on your own? Do you try to stay away from it if you can? If it fits my audience, I'm all for it. I, I especially think if it's the right product for that. I, I've seen it go gangbusters. I uh, I'm an Audible affiliate, and I do a podcast. Although this one's gonna die uh, about Jillian Michaels. It's not about the Biggest Loser. It was about Jillian Michaels, and um, because I was a big fan of her, still am. And when she came out with a book on Audible, when I said, hey, if you'd like to hear Jillian, because I, I said, hey, she, here's the news in, in Jillian's world. She has a new book out. It's called blah, blah, blah. Oh, and by the way, if you'd like to hear Jillian read this to you, you can get it for free. And here's the link and blah, blah, blah. And I got a nice four-figure affiliate check on that one. And That's I was wonderful. like, okay. I was like, all right, here we go. This is cool. And same thing for my musicians. Uh, Sammy Hagar came out with an audio book. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith came out with an audio book. Anything that interests me, in theory, typically interests my audience. So when I was like, wow, cool, I, I, I want to download that book. And I would say, and I would, you can play clips from, uh, from books off their website. I believe that's still legally possible because it's on their website. They're letting anybody listen to it anyway. And, uh, you know, get them kind of uh, a little. Uh, sneak peek of it and next thing you know you check into your affiliate stuff and uh you know there it is i mean i'm i'm logging into my website right now and in november which is what 29 days okay pretty much november i made 132 dollars and 70 cents at amazon doing nothing yeah basically you know so that pays for my web hosting for and my media and things like that for uh, for the month. And that's just from people buying microphones that I go, no, really, this is a really good microphone. You should buy it. See, I have one right here. So it's not uh, spammy. It's, I'm not, I'm not going to send people. In fact, I'm actually going to uh, take away uh, one of the things I used to promote, seismic audio mixers. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've now had three people that have said, Dave, I had to send mine back. Oh, wow. And I went... And I went, ooh, okay, because they. I mean, I'm sitting right next to one. Mine's working fine, but the the question is, I mean, you're always going to have issues with something. I mean, nobody's perfect, but it's how you handle it when things don't good. And and from what I've heard so far, their customer service, even though it was great for me, and I often wonder sometimes, maybe it was great for me because they knew I had a microphone. Not that it's a, a huge, you know, audience, but it's an audience. But the, from what I'm hearing, their customer service isn't as good as I received when I worked with them. So it's one of those where I'm going to, I might actually get them on the phone and go, what's the deal? Cause, uh, I, I like their stuff. It's been working fine for me, but I've had three people now that said, yeah, it had a hum. And one person said it, they turned it on and it smoked and basically, you know, it didn't burst into flames, but it might as well have. So that's something that I take very serious. If, if I'm re- recommending a product, it's usually cause I've used it and I like it. But if I hear my audience telling me, Hey Dave, I bought this because of you. 
and now I'm in a pickle, that's something I take very serious. Because the sure. only thing we, the it, only I mean, thing, it's your word, it's your credibility, right? That's it. The only thing we have that every single podcaster starts off with zero audience and total integrity. And it's up to you to gain the audience without losing your integrity. That's the fun part. <laughs> I think I've lost mine a couple of occasions, <laughs> the shows that I'm doing. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. And I think th there's definitely a place for that. Like you said, with, with Amazon, you're making a couple bucks with that. With uh, you know, You've gotten four-figure checks from... Uh, just talking about you know an affiliate and I, and I always tell people don't be afraid of the affiliates but make sure it works on your show when you're doing a comedy yeah. show and you're doing a, a Citrix live read it's not really going to work is it if you're doing well, a it, I mean you, it has to kind of fit into what you're doing exactly and it and to me it has to be something if I wouldn't try to sell it to my mom or, or something like that I'll give you an example the the weight loss show that I do I, I'm basically of the mindset of look eat less, exercise more. It's really that simple. Don't try to cut corners, change your lifestyle. You know, and I'm not a big fan of let's all take caffeine pills and, you know, fat burners and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, I have a company now that's, that's contacted me. They said, we have a really aggressive affiliate program. We could boost your commission and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh, cool. Send me a link to your website. And I went and it was just nothing but you know, um, stuff that I would never take personally. And I'm like, I'm not going to be able to, to, to pimp that one because I can't tell my audience, look, yeah, you know, they, they've got the you know giant fat burner. Eat this and drop the pounds. In, you know, the pounds will just fall. No, that's I don't believe that. So I can't, you know, I I, I couldn't do that. So it, it takes a lot of integrity to do it too, uh, Dave. Look, before we wrap up, I want to talk to you a little bit about the future of podcasting. You were here in the mm -hmm. beginning. Uh, you've been doing a podcast for uh, since two thousand five, which is amazing because. Most people don't last more than 20 weeks doing a podcast. Uh, I, I feel like the 21st episode is when people are like, oh, man, I don't know if I could do this anymore. It's weird. Like they could make it like six months and then they just go away. It, it's fascinating. But uh, let's talk about the future of podcasting. What do you see for the future of podcasting? Do you what do you see changing good and bad? Uh, good. I think we're going to see I think 2014. We're going to have another small dip because a lot of people came on board in 13, and when they hit that 21st episode, they're going to go, I'll forget it, and they're going to walk around and say there's there's no money in it, there's no this and that. So I think we're going to have another little dip just because it, it became so hot again in 2013. Um, I could see that happening, so that could be kind of another thing that we have to go – Okay, here we go again. Because our podcasting's numbers have gone up every single year since you know 2004, but it's died like 15 times. Right, yeah, every yeah. time you turn around. <laughs> so, so I think we'll probably have another rash of that. But I also see, you know, I hear where where Stitcher is getting into more and more cars. Um, I hear where you know Google is doing phenomenal things with with Wi-Fi and just Uber Internet. So I picture a day where we're all walking around and. Who knows? Downloading podcasts on our watch when Wi-Fi is free everywhere in every city. I mean, if we go forward 10 years, I mean, if we look back 10 years ago, we were plugging iPods, not iPhones, via a cable into our computer. We've already gone, you know, a, you know, a mile away from that at this point where you can just now stream them. You don't even have to download them. So it'll be interesting. I think it's going to be, again, more of a, a streaming thing. Hopefully there'll be more discovery. And I think the other thing is that you'll see is I'm seeing more and more services that are now coming about because there is enough people podcasting to warrant a service. There are now people that will edit your your audio for you. There will be people that, you know, there are, are more and more uh, advertising networks popping up. So I think, you know, as much as we've been doing this for, for eight, nine years now, I think we're really just getting started at this point. I it's agree with you 100. percent I mean, it, it, it's it's still the wild west out there. I mean, it's it's eight years old this podcasting concept, but uh, we still it, we're still adding services. We're still learning a lot. A lot of stuff is changing. Uh, it's it's it, it's just fascinating. It's fun to do. I mean, and the bottom line is, if you're having fun doing this, and you're doing it right. If you're not having fun, then there's something wrong. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. And it is a lot of fun. It's, uh, you know, I sit here in my office and I, I get emails from people that uh, I, I get to help. I get emails that are from people that are 
that don't think they could do it. That's my favorite kind of person. It's like, look, I, I'm not really sure. I, I would like to talk about this. I have a guy who's actually going to uh, start a, a show. He's a, it's going to be a religious podcast called the, the shy Christian. And he literally is a shy Christian. So I'm actually trying to give him the confidence to just turn on the microphone and talk. Cause he has something to say. He's just shy. So it's one of those things that, uh, I just love helping people take that first step, and then from there, it's like, okay, now let's shape your content, and here's this and that, and here's how you promote it, and here's how you record it, and all that whole nine yards. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting, because I think the more people tune into it, as we get more listeners, there's going to be that person, because I know a lot of people are like, you know, I like this podcast, I think I could do one better. Or I have something to say about this, and I want my voice to be heard. And that's where I think we're going to start seeing the people that are discovering the listeners are going to turn around and start becoming the producers. Excellent. Uh, website is School of Podcasting. If you want to learn how to do, do a podcast, uh, this is the site where you could find out pretty much everything you need to find out about it, launching a successful podcast. Uh, you do your show every week. You have uh, really important tips in the blogging that you're doing with the show. Uh, I actually I want to have you on again in, in a couple of weeks to talk about, uh, you know, the the a companion to the podcast, like a blog, because I'm noticing mm-hmm. a lot of people are doing this. And this is something that I have not done really well. Uh, I've been pretty bad at, you know, adding show notes and adding a blog attached with my podcast. So I want to have you on to talk about that as far as a companion to your podcast, what you could do alongside your podcast, because I think you're doing a great job over there. Uh, School of podcasting dot com is the website. Uh, you could sign up uh, if you want to learn how to do a podcast. Contact Dave because he's the guy to contact about this stuff. He he knows all about it. He's been here from the beginning. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you again for coming on. This was a the hour went away went really quickly. It it was. <laughs> well, they say time time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, and I was listening. Yeah. I'm like, wow, you know, I'm picking up stuff. I'm learning stuff from this conversation. And I think that's the benefit of this. Uh, people that are tuning in and people that are going to be downloading this. Uh, there are great communities out there. If you want to learn how to be, do a podcast, if you want to learn how to monetize, if you want to learn, you know, pretty much setting up your studio, there is someone out there that could help you. Uh, either you could go on the IIB forum, of course, but you could also go on Facebook and you could also go on Google. They have phenomenal communities out there with experts like Dave uh, that are that are always willing to help you out and, and, you know, just grow the community. So there's always information out there. And if you want to learn, you can. And that's the point of this. Uh, Dave, once again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it was It was actually a treat. Oh, thank you. This is a blast. And we'll see you all next week, guys. Uh, tune in next week. We're going to have uh, another special guest. I- I'm going to announce it midweek when I confirm it. But uh, the next couple of weeks, we have a lot of uh, industry experts coming on and people that have been involved in podcasting. So uh, tune in. This is also going to be on our website, gfknetwork.com, and, of course, on the IIB website. Uh, we'll see you all next week, guys. Uh, again, happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time.